Hi everybody, I'm Jack and this is Raw Tropical Living. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you're having a really nice weekend uh, so far by the time you watch this. I'm just having a nice Saturday here. Just got back from the gym. Um, it's pretty outside. Temperature's not too cold, not too hot. So uh, I'm just looking forward to a nice, uh, quiet, relaxing Saturday. A little bit of work, a little bit of relaxing. Anyhow, for our little uh, weekend talk today, it's going to be on unnecessary stress and it's all about perception. Um, I do videos every day, so if you're not already subscribed to the channel, I would appreciate it if you'd hit that subscribe button now, then click on the little bell and check send notifications so you'll stay subscribed to the channel. Very important. Uh, and I'll start out by reading uh, a little, little post I made on Facebook last week that kind of got me thinking about uh, what am I going to do for my talk this week. Sometimes I just have keep random notes around and I'll go back and look and I'm like, yeah, I think that's what I'll talk about today. Um, and I just posted something simple, uh, just kind of thinking about how we create unnecessary stress on ourselves. Unnecessary stress, stress that we can't do anything about. Um, is what I just posted, is what it is. If I can't do anything about it, why stress? Very simple, but think about it. If you can't do anything about a situation, why make it worse? Why make, you know, make your health uh, worse by sitting around and stressing over it? Because stress is, uh, stress is a killer. Stress is, is, hard, is harder on the body than alcohol, cigarettes, food, all the other stuff. So you can be eating great, and if you just can't get that stress under control, you're still going to have problems out there. Um, one thing I'm going to do today is I'm gonna share a little bit of the Panama experience with you. I've talked about that before, but uh, it was a very profound experience in my life. Um, it was about, it's coming up on five years. This, this summer will be five years because I got deported for that long. Had a little, just simple little problem, uh, which turned into me getting locked up in immigration. And I spent uh, three weeks locked up in immigration in Panama City, Panama. Um, I. I you know, it's funny, I thought about, out of all the gringos, I was the only gringo in there except for one Canadian, and I was thinking about all the people I knew in the little town where I was in Costa Rica, especially the ones my age, they would have been flipping out in here. Although, as I get started with this, let me make it clear, this was not a dangerous situation. This wasn't a prison situation. There were some heavy dudes in there. There were some rough dudes in there, but it was immigration. So it wasn't like you were worried about your safety every day, but there was a lot of, there was stressful parts about it. So let me just read a little bit here. I'm gonna read you the first page. I've been getting my notes out and reading more later lately and um, this will kind of get it get get it going you never know how a story will unfold what started out as a simple border run for my passport has me sleeping on a cot in a detention center which is a straight up refugee camp these are just my notes i've got about um 20 full pages of notes or front and back 10 pages on long paper so these are just my thoughts that i wrote while i was there in the in the midst of it uh which is straight up a refugee camp. But I'm jumping ahead in the story. It all started yesterday morning when my buddy and I crossed over into Panama. The trip in was as easy as it could be, which led me to believe that it would take about half a minute to go out. Boy, was I wrong. I knew when the immigration officer gave me a funny look and went over to talk to his superior that I was in some kind of deep shit. They beckoned me to come in, and little did I know that I would be beginning what looks to turn out to be an epic adventure. See, even then, remember what I go back to. I'll go back to that, but on perception. Even on the first day, second day, I was thinking of this as an, as an epic adventure. The supervisor informs me that I have fake stamps in my passport and that this is a very serious offense. Everything's a serious offense when you get caught down there, or they tell you. I learned quite quickly that my fast talking and bullshit wasn't going to get me out of this one. My Spanish wasn't as good as I thought it was. I'm communicative. <laughs> so I sit in the immigration office at the Paso Canoas border for 12 hours, watching the immigration officials grill everyone that comes through their lines. These folks don't play. They check everything that is supposed to be checked and shoot down the myriad of excuses offered throughout the day. They're, they were very hardcore at that border. It's nothing like that in uh, Nicaragua, which is probably why I won't ever go back there, even when I can. 
I sat there so long that I could have uh, started helping them with certain situations as the English speaking guy in the office had passable English, but wasn't getting the fine details of some of the problems. But I was in enough hot water as it was, and I definitely didn't want to be the smart ass gringo appearing to stick his nose in where it didn't belong. For some reason, a basic medical exam was of high importance for my process and they took me to four separate clinics until they found a doctor available to handle the monumental task of taking my blood pressure, heart rate, and temperature. I was being pretty zen about my difficulties and was curious to see if I was uh, letting the stress affect me. I had been doing some deep breathing on and off since the trouble began and apparently it was working as my blood pressure was 120 over 70 and my heart rate was never higher than 90 beats per minute during the day, even when I was moving around. Um, yeah, I'm a weirdo like that. I like to check my heart rate often to see how I handle situations. And that was kind of the beginning of it. And sometimes one thing I wrote later on, but not there, is they were taking me to these clinics the first couple of times. I was like a full on perp. They were perp walking me. They were perp walking me through this little town with handcuffs on the back on, behind me. And people were looking at me like, what's up with this dude? But from day one, it was a matter of perception. I spent the next night, um, after I spent that very first day being locked up, they took me, I, it looked, they figured out, you know, things didn't work out. If I could have gotten some money, I could have gotten out of there that day, but it didn't work out. So it looks like I'm going to go from the border to Panama City the next day. Well, they stick me in this little cell um, at the border that was like, I was by myself. Once again, it wasn't anything dangerous, even in this little holding cell. I haven't gotten to the detention center yet, but in this little holding cell. But man, they didn't have nothing in there. It was concrete slabs for beds. And I spent the whole night, I kind of spent the whole night just setting my mind. I didn't sleep very much. When you don't have nothing but concrete and no padding, there's not a whole lot of sleeping going on. So um, I wasn't really... Uh, doing regular meditation at the time, but that started it right there. I pretty much meditated a lot uh, throughout the night. Prayer, meditation, um, and what have you. Get the next day, go to, go. it's like a four or five hour drive from the border to Panama City, so we go there. Finally get checked in, and then I'm in where I'm gonna be settled for the next three weeks with a um, bunch of people from different countries that had immigration problems. A lot were from closer countries. The majority were Colombians. Um, had some cool Colombians in there. Dominican, Dominican Republic. Um, not as many from Costa Rica, not as many people from Costa Rica go down to Panama. There are also refugees in there, people coming from Bangladesh, Somalia. Saw a lot of different cultures. Saw, saw uh, my friends, people from Bangladesh, they were Muslim. They would pray. They would pull out their rugs and they would pray five times a day. So I, it was, it was, I interacted with a lot of um, different cultures, a lot of different thoughts. And this one, this probably episode, I was probably about a year into my raw food lifestyle at the time, my raw vegan lifestyle. But see, I always try to like make it clear that there was more for me than just changing my food. I had been a drunk. I had had a lot of stuff in my life. I had made a profound lifestyle change, um, you know, going back about a year before that. And I kind of think sometimes, how would, have I, how would I have handled this living the old way I did? So I get settled in and um, it, it really, it turned out it, it was an interesting three weeks that I wouldn't trade for anything. I think of like I had to make a note and remember this guy, Cuba. His name was Cuba. He just had nicknames in there. He was from Cuba. He had been in there a good while. Really cool guy. Super smart chess player. He'd play two people at uh, one time, sometime just to challenge himself. Big dude, about 250. Ended up uh, helping me out, saving my ass in there uh, one time when I was a little bit at a weak point. But um, I remember him one of the first days since he knew everybody in there. He's a very uh, jovial type person, and he comes up to me, and I'm talk we, get, we get talking sometimes. Somehow I'm able to tell him, well, you're locked up in here. I'm like, yeah, but I'm happy. And he's like, how can you be happy? You're locked up in here. I'm like, well, I don't have a choice. I'm locked up in here. I can't get out. But I, what my, my, my free will has been taken away here. So I can either sit around here and stress and be all, oh, my God, oh, my God, or I can just, you know, accept it and make the best of it I can. So make the best of it I can, I did. Um, I spent that three weeks and it was probably the best three weeks of my life. Um, 
just, I was unplugged, obviously. I had no computer, had no phone, had no gadgets, had no nothing. So I read, I read actual books. Luckily, the guy that was next to me was from Lebanon and he had brought, a, he had a bunch of books with him and he had a bunch of paper. So I read all his books, read some good books, read Walden again for how many, however much times I've read that. Um, and I wrote a lot. So I read, I wrote, I prayed, I meditated. Um, and the only time I ever fasted was while I was in there. I did an eight day water fast and went through some trippy stuff in my head. Uh, maybe another episode, another time, I'll read some of the stuff during the days of my water fasting and like where my head was going. I was going in and out. It was trippy at times. I'd get weak and real kind of sickly feeling at times. Then I'd have energy. Um, I would spend day, I would spend hours and hours just laying on my cot, not moving, just looking at a point on the wall. But I digress. So I spent this three weeks, you know, working on myself, going inward, observing. Um, and over the first probably week in there, Every time Cuba would come by, he would joke with me. He didn't say it in a mean way, but he was like, hey, happy boy. Hey, happy boy. You still happy over there? And I'd be like, yeah, Cuba, I'm still happy. Just doing the best I can. And that week, I mean, those the, the, the days turned into a week. The week turned into several, and it was three weeks in there. And I'm not going to sit there and tell you I was zen as F the whole time. You know, once but when I wasn't sure what was even going on. I was a little bit more stressed with it, but I always kept that level down. Even at my most stressed during there, I wasn't like freaking out or anything. Um, and like I say, what would have been to some people, like when I tell people about this experience and, uh, and certain aspects of it, they just imagine that as the worst possible scenario that could ever happen in their lives. And to me, I don't know if I'd say the best, but I rank it up there, maybe in the top three, the top five, that it was one of the best things that ever happened to me in my life. I learned so much about myself, just about life, and it shaped a lot of who I am and how I present myself now and a lot of the things I share here. Um, I'll finish up just by telling you this and you can tell the difference. There's a little function on YouTube. If you go to anybody's channel, if you're interested, you can go into their videos and you can hit click on something and it, and it takes you back. You know, normally you would see their videos from the most recent back. Well, you can change that. You can go back to their first video and watch from the beginning. Well, I had done my very first YouTube video, I think the day, maybe the day before I went to Panama when this ordeal started. So from my first uh, video to my second video, there was probably about a month or a, yeah, there was about a month lapse, a three or four week lapse. Oh, and you can see like between eating, between water fasting for eight days, between eating very little coming off the water fast, between, I was basically starved for three weeks. So you will see an emaciated looking Jack in that one. But yeah, it, it, most everything in life is perception. I would say 80% of everything in life is not about what's actually going on, but what our perception of it is. And um, I, it's just, you want to help people, but there's just some things like you can't necessarily translate your experience or your thoughts to somebody else. They just don't get it. Um, I just, I don't understand. It just, it's a concept that just, it just baffles me. People stressing over what they can't control. There's enough stuff to stress over out there that we probably can control, but if you can't do anything about it, let it go. Just breathe, you know? And since that time, that's what I, that's what I have, that kind of planted the seed that has like carried me to different things I've been working on over these past five years. And that's why for me, very much from the early on, I just can't blather on and on about food all the time. There's just so much more to my practices than just this obsession with how well you're eating with, oh, am I the cleanest of the clean? Oh, am I going to do another detox healing? I mean, I kind of, the food was a catalyst that got enough things cleared out of me, whether it's my body, my mind, everything that got me to where I wanted to be to do, start doing the real work. And that's kind of where I am now. So anyhow, just remember that the next time you're having a stressful day, ask yourself if you can do anything about it. If you can't, just accept it and make the best you can. Stop, take a few breaths, regroup. 
Anyhow, hope you guys enjoyed this one today. If you like it, please give me a thumbs up, and I'll see you again tomorrow. Peace.